In the heart of New England, Lizzie Borden's name echoes with infamy. Born into privilege just before the American Civil War, she was expected to lead a conventional life of motherhood. However, fate had other plans, thrusting her into a chilling tale that would make her one of America's most notorious murder suspects. On a fateful day in August 1892, a double homicide shocked Fall River, Massachusetts, and Lizzie became the prime suspect. The genteel facade she once wore crumbled, leaving a chilling enigma that captivated the nation. Did she brutally murder her father and stepmother, or was she caught up in a nightmarish web of deceit? As we delve into the depths of this perplexing tale, I invite you to share your thoughts and theories. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Curious True Crime Tuesday. Lizzie Borden was born on July 19, 1860, to Andrew and Sarah Borden, but tragedy struck her early on. Her middle sister, Alice, passed away when Lizzie was a child. Then, she lost her mother Sarah, leaving her without maternal care. Three years later her father, Andrew, married Abby Durfee Gray in an attempt to bring stability to their lives. As a young woman, Lizzie immersed herself in her community, engaging in church activities, teaching Sunday school, and championing women's rights and social reform movements of the late 1800s. Lizzie's father had risen from modest beginnings to amass considerable wealth. Many people say he was known for his frugality, refusing to indulge in a lavish lifestyle. While electricity illuminated homes of the fortunate, Andrew clung to the nostalgic glow of kerosene oil lamps. And while indoor plumbing was a mainstay in the homes of the well-to-do, Andrew preferred the simplicity of chamber pots. These rumors simply were not true. The Borden house indeed had indoor plumbing both in the kitchen and in the cellar where they had a flushable privy. Another rumor is, despite the family's wealth, her father's frugality denied Lizzie the life of privilege she longed for. So, the pursuit of saving money became her daily endeavor. In a world where others indulged, she carefully crafted her own dresses from cheap fabrics. Each stitch was a tangible expression of her desire for a life of elegance beyond her reach. This again was not true, as Lizzie and her sister Emma had an allowance provided by their father and Emma was visiting their seamstress on the day of the murders. Growing up, Lizzie had no recollection of her biological mother, so when stepmother Abby came into the picture, Lizzie lovingly called her mother. This, however, was different for Emma, as she always referred to Abby as Mrs. Borden. When their father bestowed valuable property on Abby's family, this upset both Emma and Lizzie, leading Lizzie to start calling Abby Mrs. Borden. A relative of Abby's was being evicted from her home, so Andrew gave her property so she wouldn't be homeless. This didn't sit well with Lizzie and Emma, and they decided they wanted property as well. Andrew decided to hand over the deed to their late mother's family home and the girls became landlords to the house. This lasted very briefly because the girls didn't like all the work that came with it, so they sold it back to their father for $5,000. In August, the entire family fell ill. On the morning of August 3rd, Abby sought help from a nearby doctor, fearing someone was trying to poison them. When the doctor arrived at the Borden home, Lizzie hurried upstairs and Andrew refused his visit, not wanting to spend any additional money to pay the doctor. Oddly, later that day, Lizzie tried to buy prussic acid, claiming it was for cleaning a sealskin cape. Then enters John Morse. John was Lizzie and Emma's uncle on their biological mother's side. He was coming to town to discuss business dealings with their father and was going to be staying with them for a few days. That evening, Lizzie visited her neighbor, Alice Russell. Lizzie would often visit Alice and discuss her personal thoughts and feelings about life, as well as concerns about her father's business practices. Upon returning home around 9 p.m., Lizzie went directly to her room, seemingly ignoring her father and uncle, who were likely discussing business matters. After a breakfast on August 4, John Morse left the house to visit other family members across town. Andrew saw him off, inviting him back for dinner later in the day. As the morning progressed, Abby, feeling somewhat improved, asked Bridget Sullivan, the Irish live-in maid, to clean the house's windows inside and out. However, Bridget, still suffering from the food poisoning that had affected the entire household, soon went outside to be sick. After a brief break to gather herself, Bridget resumed her cleaning. Around 9.30, while making her way toward the barn, she encountered Lizzie standing in the back doorway. Lizzie told Bridget not to lock the doors as long as she was outside working. Meanwhile, Abby was cleaning the second floor guest room which was normally a chore for Lizzie and Emma. There, sometime between 9 and 10, she was brutally murdered with a hatchet. Abby initially faced her attacker when the hatchet collided with her head just above her right ear. She then collapsed to the floor, where she received 19 additional blows to the back of her head. 
the number of strikes suggested that the killer's actions might have been driven by more than just the desire to end her life quickly and might suggest a deeper and more personal reason for wanting Abby Borden dead. Andrew returned home from his morning walk at 10.30 but found himself locked out of his own house and had to rely on Bridget to open the door for him. Bridget, whom the family lovingly called Maggie, was washing windows inside at the time, heard Lizzie laughing at her from the top of the stairs while she struggled to open the door. Oddly enough, Lizzie should have been able to see Abby's bludgeoned body bleeding on the guest room carpet, but she seemed unfazed. Andrew, still weak from the recent sickness, laid down to take a nap on the downstairs sofa. Lizzie spent her time ironing and engaging in other ordinary activities while Bridget completed the window cleaning before heading to her room to take a nap. Around 11, Lizzie called frantically for Bridget saying, Maggie, come quick, father's dead. Somebody came in and killed him. When Bridget entered the parlor, she was met with a horrifying sight. Andrew Borden was slumped on the couch, still bleeding, suggesting a recent attack. He had been struck 10 or 11 times in the head with a hatchet-like weapon, and his left eyeball was cut in half, indicating he might have been asleep when attacked. Bridget was sent out to find a doctor but was unsuccessful in locating Dr. Bowen. Instead, she returned to inform Lizzie, who then asked Bridget to fetch Alice Russell because she couldn't bear to be alone in the house. Meanwhile, another neighbor, Mrs. Adelaide Churchill, noticed Bridget's distress and came to inquire about the situation. After speaking with Lizzie briefly, Mrs. Churchill also went to find a doctor. Within minutes, news of the tragedy spread, and someone used a telephone to call the police. The Fall River Police Force quickly arrived at the Borden House, accompanied by a curious and concerned crowd of city residents. Dr. Bowen, who had been found and informed, joined the police, Bridget, Mrs. Churchill, Alice Russell, and Lizzie as they moved through the house, trying to make sense of the gruesome scene. The body of Mr. Borden was covered with a sheet, and Bridget eerily remarked that they should grab two. Lizzie's behavior was unsettling to those present. She showed no signs of distress or visible emotion, and her responses to initial questioning were contradictory. At first, Lizzie claimed she had been in the barn during the time of the murders, looking for some iron to fix her screen door. However, she later changed her story, saying she had been in the barn searching for lead sinkers for an upcoming fishing trip. Her account of hearing strange noises from inside the house also shifted from claiming to have heard something alarming to denying any unusual sounds. One peculiar detail in Maggie's account was that she said she helped Andrew change out of his boots and into his slippers when he returned home. This claim was easily disputed by photographic evidence, as Andrew Borden was pictured in crime scene images still wearing his boots. Therefore, he must have been wearing them when the attack occurred. The strangeness of Lizzie's behavior continued to raise suspicion. At first, she mentioned that her stepmother had received a note and was out of the house. However, she later changed her story, suggesting that she thought she had heard Abby return and might be upstairs. Bridget and Mrs. Churchill were tasked with investigating Abby's whereabouts. As they went upstairs, they were met with a horrifying sight in the guest bedroom. Abby Borden lay on the floor, bludgeoned and lifeless. The discovery of both Andrew and Abby's murders inside their own home in broad daylight sent shockwaves through the community. Lizzie's peculiar demeanor and contradictory statements became the immediate focus of suspicion, but there were others whose behavior was also closely scrutinized. John Morse, the girl's uncle, arrived at the Borden home unaware of the tragedy that had occurred. After picking and eating a pear from the backyard tree, he entered the house and was informed of the murders. He reportedly spent most of the day in the backyard after viewing the bodies, which some found suspicious, but it could also have been a natural reaction to the shock of the scene. Meanwhile, Lizzie's sister, Emma, was away visiting her seamstress in Fairhaven and remained completely unaware of the tragedy until she received a telegraph asking her to return home. Interestingly, she did not immediately take any of the first three available trains back, which added a layer of intrigue to the unfolding events. The Fall River Police, criticized for their lack of thoroughness, failed to diligently search both the house and the people present during the morning of the murders. Lizzie's strange behavior raised suspicions, but investigators didn't thoroughly check her for bloodstains or other evidence. Looking through a woman's belongings was considered inappropriate at the time, even if she was the primary suspect in a double murder case. The only reliable accounts of Lizzie's appearance that morning came from Alice Russell and Bridget Sullivan during their testimonies nearly a year later. Both vehemently denied seeing anything unusual with Lizzie's hair or clothing at the time. During the search of the house, several hatchets were discovered in the cellar, with one particular hatchet drawing suspicion due to its broken handle. Though it didn't have any blood on it, the surrounding dirt and ash suggested an attempt to conceal it. However, the hatchets were not immediately removed from the house and were left there for several days before being taken as evidence. As for the note that was said to have been delivered to Abby Borden, it was never found. Lizzie couldn't recall its whereabouts, and her friend Alice suggested she might have thrown it in the fire to dispose of it, to which Lizzie responded affirmatively. 
As the hours dragged on, Andrew and Abby's bodies were photographed and then laid on the dining room table for examination. Medical experts removed their stomachs to test for poison, but the results came back negative. Covered in white sheets, their bodies remained in the dining room for the next few days. On the evening of August 4th, after the initial police investigation had concluded, Emma, Lizzie, John, and Alice were still in the house. The atmosphere was tense, with bloodstains lingering on the wallpaper and carpet, and the odor from the bodies beginning to pervade the air. Suspicion surrounded those inside the house, John Morse due to his potential financial or familial motivations, Bridget for her Irish heritage and possible resentment towards Abby, and Lizzie for her bizarre behavior and inconsistent alibi. Officers from the Fall River Police were stationed outside the house, both to keep curious onlookers at bay and to ensure the residents inside remained under close watch. The list of potential suspects was lengthy, and the police were taking no chances. During the evening, an officer observed Lizzie and Alice Russell heading to the house's cellar, carrying a kerosene lamp and a pail, likely belonging to either Andrew or Abby. They both left together, but Lizzie returned alone shortly afterward. Though the officer couldn't see what she was doing, Lizzie spent some time bent over the sink. After a few uneventful days, Alice Russell witnessed something that made her deeply anxious and led her to hide the truth. Lizzie and Emma were in the kitchen when Alice, who had been staying with them during the police proceedings, noticed Lizzie holding a blue dress. Curious, she asked Lizzie what she intended to do with it, and Lizzie replied that she was going to burn it because it was soiled, faded, and covered in paint stains. However, Alice found this explanation questionable, and her suspicions were heightened when she later learned from Emma that the dress had been made only a few weeks before and would have taken at least two days to sew. If it had been worn around the house as Lizzie claimed, it couldn't have been as ruined as they described. Moreover, the timing of the dress's destruction was suspiciously convenient. Just a day after Mayor John W. Coughlin informed Lizzie that the investigation was progressing, and she was a prime suspect, the dress was burned in the kitchen stove. Alice was convinced that this was a terrible idea and would only make Lizzie appear more suspicious. When Alice confronted Lizzie about the dress, Lizzie was horrified and asked why Alice hadn't stopped her from burning it. Nevertheless, Alice hesitated to reveal the truth and even lied to an investigator initially. However, during her third testimony, almost a year later, she finally came clean about what she had witnessed. This revelation caused a rift between the two friends, and they stopped speaking to each other from that point on. August 8th was the inquest hearing. Lizzie asked for her family lawyer to be present but was denied because the hearing was to be private. She had been prescribed morphine to calm her nerves making it possible that her testimony was affected. She behaved erratically and refused to answer questions even if the answers would benefit her. Just like when she spoke with the police and her stories often conflicted. On August 11th, following the funerals of Andrew and Abby and an investigation into multiple suspects, including John Morse, Bridget, Emma, and an innocent Portuguese immigrant who was later released, Lizzie Borden was officially charged with double homicide and taken to jail. She would spend the next 10 months awaiting trial, and her case quickly became a national sensation. The public's fascination with the case was immediate. From the moment news of the murders broke, people flocked to the Borden house, eager to catch a glimpse inside. The case became a media frenzy, with newspapers publishing sensationalized stories about Lizzie Borden's alleged heartless act of murdering her parents. On June 5, 1893, nearly a year after the murders, Lizzie Borden's trial began. To add to the tension, another axe murder had recently taken place in Fall River, with striking similarities to the Borden murders. However, it was determined that the two incidents were unrelated, but the coincidence only intensified public fascination. Throughout the trial, the most significant issues were the potential murder weapon and Lizzie Borden's whereabouts during the murders. Her story continued to be inconsistent and didn't add up. The hatchet found in the basement was presented as a possible murder weapon, but forensic tests showed no traces of blood on it. In a dramatic move, investigators brought out the clean skulls of Andrew and Abby to demonstrate the brutality of their deaths and to suggest the hatchet as the weapon. This display shocked the public, especially those in Fall River, and Lizzie fainted at the sight. Conflicting testimonies and contradictory facts persisted during the trial. Officers who initially found the hatchet reported differing accounts of seeing a wooden handle next to it. Despite attempts to connect the hatchet to the murders, there was no conclusive evidence linking it to the crime. On June 20, 1893, the grand jury began their deliberations. Surprisingly, after just an hour of discussion, they reached a decision. Lizzie Borden was acquitted of the murders. Despite the intense media speculation and the initial suspicions of the investigators, the evidence against her was considered to be purely circumstantial and insufficient to prove her guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. 
As she walked out of the courthouse, a free woman, Lizzie Borden expressed her relief and happiness to reporters, claiming to be the happiest woman in the world. Her acquittal marked the end of the trial that had captured the nation's attention and created one of the most enduring murder mysteries in American history. Over the years, numerous theories and speculations have emerged, trying to make sense of the motivations behind the murders and the unusual behavior of Lizzie Borden. The theory of a forbidden love affair between Lizzie and Bridget is one of the more sensational speculations, and while it lacks concrete evidence, it reflects the complexity and intrigue that surrounds the case. Similarly, the idea of Lizzie being in a dissociative fugue state at the time of the murder speaks to the psychological and emotional trauma she may have endured. The theory of sexual abuse within the family, particularly involving Lizzie, is a dark and disturbing possibility. While there is no definitive proof of such abuse, the family dynamics and Lizzie's behavior, such as nailing her bedroom door shut, have led some to consider this as a possible motive for the murders. Another suspect is John Morse. He had given police a perfectly over-detailed alibi of his whereabouts during Andrew and Abby's death. In his alibi, John mentioned being on a street car with seven priests. When the police questioned the conductor, he confirmed that indeed seven priests were passengers on his street car that day. After the trial and acquittal, Lizzie Borden's life took a somewhat different turn. She changed her name to Elizabeth and moved to a new house with her sister Emma, enjoying a life of wealth and privilege, surrounded by staff and indulging in the trappings of high society. However, despite her newfound affluence, she could never fully escape the shadow of suspicion and public scrutiny. The people of Fall River and beyond were divided in their opinions of her innocence or guilt. Many continued to believe that she was indeed the murderer and that she had somehow escaped justice. As a result, Lizzie faced social isolation and was shunned by some members of the community. Additionally, the 1897 shoplifting accusation in Providence, Rhode Island, added to her reputation as a suspect character. Even though she was acquitted of the charges, it only fueled further gossip and speculation about her. Lizzie Borden lived out the rest of her days leading a relatively reclusive life, especially in her later years. Her sister Emma had moved out of the house in 1905 after they had an argument about a party Lizzie had thrown for actress Nance O'Neill. The sisters never spoke to each other again. Lizzie died of pneumonia on June 1, 1927, at the age of 66. Emma followed nine days later in a nursing home in New Hampshire. She was 76. The sisters are buried side by side in the family plot at Oak Grove Cemetery. What do I believe? I'm not really sure. I found a compelling theory while watching an episode from the YouTube channel Glam and Gore. Mikey, the creator of the channel, and some of her friends stayed at the Borden house in the upstairs guest room where Abby was murdered. During a spirit box session, after being asked who the killer was, a voice was captured clearly saying, it was John. The voice sounded so scary and angry. This still gives me goosebumps. As someone who believes in the paranormal, I believe this was a direct answer from Abby. Now was this the case of two murderers and was Lizzie the one who killed her father? I have no clue. I do know that this was a very interesting case, but I'd like to know what you think. Was Lizzie guilty of these brutal murders or was someone else responsible? Let us know in the comments. Thank you all so much for watching. We'll see you next time on our next Curious True Crime Tuesday. Stay curious.